We have uh, Klaus Dolan, who you heard his name mentioned earlier, has worked on the Boston keratoprosthesis. There are two types, which we'll show a picture of here later, and then the Alpha Core, which was developed in Australia. So those are really the two that are commonly used in the United States. I shouldn't say commonly, because there aren't very many people that will undertake this procedure. It's very difficult and has, uh, as we'll see, a lot of things that can happen. <coughs> Well, we prefer a human cornea. Let's see here. All right. So this is actually the alpha core that we'll talk about here first. Maybe. So what is a keratoprosthesis? It's basically a synthetic device to replace the human cornea. Um, why is it needed? A couple things. Let me go through all these. Some patients just continue to reject the human cornea. Um, there are some patients that we have that have had three, four, five corneas, and for, for various reasons, they just will not take a human cornea. Um, obviously, not all countries are lucky enough to have an eye make like we do here in the, in the United States, thanks to Dr. Patton back in 1945, who set up the first eye bank in New York. Uh, we're very fortunate to have something like this, and a lot of other countries don't have the availability of corneal tissue. So could an artificial cornea be used in that setting? Hopefully so. 10 to 15 million people are, are corneal blind in the world, so this could be a great uh, avenue. And really, I want you to take from this slide is De Quincey is a, was a Frenchman, and back in 1789, first proposed, hey, I bet we could take a glass piece and put it over the cornea if it got cloudy, and I, and I think someone could probably see through that. That was the first hypothesis that maybe a, a keratoprosthesis could be used. So you can see we're now 2005. It's taken us a while to come around because there have been very many setbacks. But in fact, this is actually you know, the 100th anniversary of the first successful cornea transplant, which was done in 1905 by Professor Zern, which is he was from what's commonly known now as Czechoslovakia. But, so that was done in 1905. So you can see it took a while to get there. Uh, AlphaCore is it's, it's called PHEMA, polyhema. And it's basically a little skirt with a, I think we've got a picture here again, with a poly, uh, polyhema skirt surrounding a central clear, almost plastic-like disc. This is showing how that integrates into the eye, into the sclera, and into the cornea based because of that polyhema substance. That's sort of the uh, biointegration pattern here that you see is what the alpha core proponents like about that device. Um, here's a picture of it here. You can see the polyhema, the, uh, the little white skirt out to the side, and then the central plastic core here. Uh, this is non-rigid. It's very easy to break, so you have to be very careful with these devices because they're very fragile. Uh, that's essentially what it looks like. A couple things with alpha core that you have to think about. It's not good for infections, especially herpes simplex and herpes zoster. We tend to have very unstable corneas, so we don't like to use them in those situations. Um, also, it's someone that may have diseases that you want, that might be predisposed to a corneal melting phenomenon. Uh, it may not be a good good reason to use the alpha core. Um, here's Dr. Hamilton. He's not here, so we'll show his picture. Um, this was what a year and a half ago, maybe even two years, when he did the first one here at Piedmont Hospital, which is where we both work. And essentially alpha core is two stages. The first stage is where you actually, you can actually see this on the monitor, see how he's implanted that into the cornea? So you make a little window, I'll show that here. You make a, a large incision, very large, like old intercapsular cataract surgery. And there's a picture of how that cornea is kind of uh, extended back. And you do that lamellar dissection, similar to, to the way Terry does his. And there's some more dissection there. And then you basically insert this device underneath that folded piece of cornea right here. Um, that's after you've punched out. This is a three millimeter punch. You want to make a hole in that posterior part of the cornea. That's going to be your back window into the eye. And then you're going to fold the top part over the eye. Suture that in. You see here the large incision being closed, and there's an alpha core artificial cornea. So look here, this is a cloudy membrane over there, so that has to be removed in stage two before they're going to have good vision back. 
that's what I think is the negative part of the alpha core is that it, it takes a little bit longer to get it. Um, so stage two surgery, you can see this looks, it, it looks a little bit different. As you can tell, there's, there's this white skirt, there's a, a different appearance in the eye, but you've got to remember, these are patients that don't have any other option. These people were blind. This is the only option for them to have vision. And so look how clear that central part is. They've got good vision. There have been several patients with this that are 20 20. And they've had a contact lens put on that eye. So and you can see here the 96% versus you know, corneal vascularization is one of the bad risk factors for a cornea transplant. If you have four quadrant vessel, I would even say it's probably even a little bit lower than 74%. So the alpha core is much, much more retention, much more success compared to human cornea. You can see that the, the eye there, so it does look a little bit different, asymmetrical. But there again, these patients had no other option, so these patients can be very happy. Um, so that, I think we've talked about most of those things. Um, I also wanted to mention the Dolman keratoprosthesis. I just did uh, the first one of these at Piedmont Hospital on June 1st. So this is a fairly new thing here. Um, I think Emory has done maybe two or three, uh, Diane Song. And so this is a fairly old technology, really. Klaus Dolman's worked for 40 years. This is, as Hank has spent, you know, his research years on the cornea and epithelium, Dr. Dolman has really spent his life on trying to find an artificial cornea. And he's at Harvard, he's at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary, so some of you may even be a patient of his, although he's actually uh, announced retirement. He's, he's 80, 80 uh, maybe 81 or 82, so he's been at this a long time. He has two devices. Uh, this is the one that I used this smaller one. This one's for more severe eye disease. I mentioned to you the alpha core shouldn't be used in people that have melting problems. You can use this type 2 if someone has a melting disorder and you have to do the surgery a little bit different, but um, it, it can be used in situations like that. Um, it's a, it's, I'll show you here. This is essentially what you do. You have the hum This is the human cornea that I get from Bruce that we have to use with this. You don't use a human cornea with the alpha core. You already have the cornea there. So you're actually going to do this just like a normal cornea transplant, which is why what I like about it. Uh, you have this top plate that sits here on the top of the cornea, and the back plate actually sits on the bottom, and there's a titanium screw that actually helps to bound that in and sandwich that cornea in. Here's a picture of it. And then we just sew that in just like you saw on the video. Sew it in exactly the same, except instead of using a running stitch, we use individual 16 individual stitches. So it's even a little bit more delicate than a running stitch. Why don't you use a running stitch? You really shouldn't use a running stitch um, in someone who has an unstable cornea where you're worried about potentially uh, melting or potential vessels into the eye. Vessels are really a relative contraindication to using a running stitch. That's why with Fuchs dystrophy, it's actually kind of lucky that you can use a running stitch pretty much most of the time, as Alan said, a very high success rate. But classic teaching will tell you if there's vascularization of the cornea, a running stitch really is contraindicated. And also in children, there's actually been a seven-year-old child that was just reported in archives, I believe, last year, who's had this dolan. And so any child that we do a transplant on always gets interrupted stitches. They never have a running suture. Uh, question? Back. Yes, can you explain what you mean by melting? Uh, good question. Um, <laughs> Melting is essentially where the cornea is very unstable and those layers that you see on the slides where we've shown you the normal corneal thickness, there's been some type of process in the eye, some type of disease that's made it thin. And if the cornea thins too much, it can actually melt a hole into the eye. So, as I mentioned to you, these patients have very sick eyes. And so, um, so this, this procedure is probably better than the alpha core if so you're worried about that happening. So this is a picture here of, of the cornea, just like we used it. See the pink material is that Ophisolve GS material that comes from the eye vein. That's the antibiotic and the different uh, media. This is the central plate. It has these little <coughs> porous material so that it actually helps get oxygen better to the cornea. That's something Klaus has realized is more beneficial in his 40 years of work. We didn't used to have that. And then this shows the titanium screw that actually helps to hold that in place. And there's a picture of it. Um, this is exactly what my patient looked like yesterday. And 
this is actually one of Klaus's. He's about two months out. And you can see here all these individual, there's 16 of them, stitches there. There's also, if you can make this out, a very thin a bandage contact lens, almost just like a contact that sits over this eye. And that helps keep the, the, the cornea moist. So that's, that's, that's another thing that Klaus has realized is very critical for keeping this to work. And that's something that you don't have to do with the alpha core. But you can see the perfect clear center. And the pay, I, you know, my end of one uh, patient yesterday was four days out. She's now 2070 in that one eye. She was t only could see light before that. Wow. So that's the, that's the beauty of the K-Pro. It's called the K-Pro. That's the abbreviation versus the alpha core. If you can get quick vision recovery. Uh, here's another one of Klaus's patients that he sent me with uh, repeat graft rejection. I think this patient had had five transplants. And here's what they look like now, eight years later. So, still looks crystal clear. This cannot reject. Um, the only, only problems with these, like I mentioned, is this could potentially cause that melting where the cornea thins. Um, and you can even get uh, extrudement, which means uh, lifting off of the process. You can imagine if those things thin out, that this could be a problem. Um, and that's the same thing with the alpha core. So, of Klaus, is, he's done over 350 of these capros uh, throughout the years. And gosh, this was probably this was six months ago, so he's probably done more. And he has a 95% retention rate at five years, which is amazing. And that was the worry with these back in the in the 70s and 80s when this was being done is the retention rate wasn't as good and now that the technology has gotten a lot better um, I think, we've, I think we're, we're making a lot of progress. The thing I wanted to mention briefly, I know we're running short on time uh, this is a, a study done at Case Western um, the group there is looking and Dr. Edda Hauser and I were talking about this earlier about you know, it would be nice to find what is the gene that is causing this problem and there are some isolated reports that you might see a gene, um, I think the COL gene was the one I recently read about um, out of the Wilmer group, which is, is found in some patients with Fuchs. But we don't know the whole picture. Are there more genes? Are there several genes together that may contribute to this? But as, Jeff, as you know, it's definitely a hereditary process, so we, we will find a gene. And as Dr. Kazarski mentioned, when we find that gene, that brings in a whole new ballgame for treatment. Gene therapy is where this is probably heading. And that's the exciting thing about this. So this study is actually looking for patients now, currently enrolling patients. So I think we have uh, enclosed in your handouts there a form where you can contact uh, Case Western and let them know if you want to be a part of it. Essentially all it requires is consent from your ophthalmologist and yourself. They want to draw some blood from you so we can look at your DNA, look at your genetic type and typing and figure out um, you know, over a large number of patients what genes are common in this particular situation. As we know, women have this disease more commonly than men, but um, it does affect both genders. And um, like I said earlier, there are single family reports of genes, but we don't have a globalized uh, genetic mapping of this district yet. And this is being funded by the NEI, so I think it's still actually trying to receive funding now. So it's, very, it's in the very early beginnings of this. And, uh, pretty much about it. So obviously the goal is to identify the gene for Fuchs dystrophy. There's a sign-up sheet against the wall in the back. Right, I'll, I'll mention that. Great. Perfect. I think that's all I have.